Uh, ciao a tutti, anzi hi all, uh, this panel will be in English because we have uh, English uh, speakers in the panel, uh, so you have to uh, listen in English and stuff like that. And uh, uh, in this panel we talk about uh, network neutrality and uh, uh, it's say divided in two half. In the first half uh, we um, we, 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 uh, each, each one of the speaker will uh, present uh, um, uh, or a project or talk a bit about uh, some issue of network neutrality and in the second half we will discuss uh, and uh, we will uh, gather um, questions from the audience uh, and uh, so you, you can in interact and uh, everything. Uh, well, um, uh, what about the first uh, half uh, of uh, the panel? In the first half uh, um, uh, we, we have initially uh, Stefano Quintarelli and uh, uh, Alessandro Zorer who um, uh, will talk about uh, um, the different aspects of network neutrality uh, as a problem and then um, we will uh, um, we will talk uh, about uh, three different projects that attacks uh, the problem of network neutrality uh, from uh, the different angles and uh, you, you will see all uh, of that uh, and uh, the, the speakers will be for Neobot, which is uh, uh, the, the first uh, project, me and uh, Monica Senor. And uh, then uh, um, we have uh, Tiziana, uh, which is uh, remotely uh, interacting. Uh, and she will talk about MLab. And finally, Jeremy Zimmerman will uh, talk about uh, Respect My Net. So I think we can start with uh, a short introduction on network neutrality by Stefano. So thank you for having invited me. I apologize for not being able to be uh, there today physically, uh, but we are very close to Christmas and I mean, we, ha we all have family obligations. Furthermore, I have a problem with my uh, at home, so I, I really could not make it. Um, I would like to put, to start by saying that when we talk about network neutrality, more or less we have a general idea what it means, not interfering with the traffic, but precisely what does it mean. I mean, uh, I believe that uh, there are many, I mean, it's like talking about freedom. Every one of us have, has a clear idea what freedom is, but then when you have, when you have to define it, it's very complicated. And, and each of us has a slightly different idea of what freedom means. And every one of us has a slight different idea of what network neutrality includes. So the basic fundamental principle about network neutrality, in my view, is the prevention of two misbehaviors. The first one, competitive misbehavior in the marketplace. And the second one, civil rights and uh, um, assurance of civil rights for, for, for people. So these are the two things, the two values that uh, when we talk about network neutrality, we want to uh, uh, enforce. So civil rights and competition in the marketplace, fair competition and a uh, playing level field between operators. If we look at the things from this uh, point of view, then uh, we can start to analyze in more in detail the context because not all the context is the same. Uh, fi uh, fixed networks and wireless networks have uh, uh, are significantly different Fixed networks have a dedicated loop, so the access from the home of the user up to the exchange of the telco operator is dedicated. And by dedicated, it means that it's not shared. We don't have a, a tragedy of the commons problem on the dedicated loop. While in the wireless network, the access loop is shared. And being shared, it implies that we have a tragedy of the networks, uh, a tragedy of the commons problem on that portion of the network, and therefore we need to have some kind of agreed set of rules that we must somehow uh, uh, employ in order to have a, a fair use of the uh, access portion uh, of the wireless network. Then, when you access the exchange after the exchange or after the tower of the wireless network you might have also a congestion problem there, an overbooking there, a tragedy of the commons in that portion of the network. And that happens when, for example, the physical exchange is connected to the core network. The core network is mainly fiber, so there is no capacity problem there. Or, okay, let me, let, let me be more precise. Uh, the nice thing about fiber compared to copper is that fiber can be, uh, the capacity, the throughput of the fiber can be 
expanded just by changing the equipment and the cost in the equipment is reducing the, co the, the cost performance of the equipment of the equipment is reducing faster than the growth of the traffic which means simply that there is no economic sense to manage traffic on a, on a backhaul fiber network but rather it is more convenient to change the equipment and to remove the scarcity so when you don't have the scarcity you don't have the tragedy of the commons on the portion of the network from uh, the exchange to the core network uh, on the backholding portion and, and therefore the, there is no uh, a structural need of a policy to have a fair usage of that portion of the network uh, of course this is not always possible sometimes the the, the loop, uh, the, the, the backhauling from the exchange to the core network is in copper and replacing, or, or wireless even, and replacing it with fiber is simply too cost. It costs too much if uh, uh, you take in consideration the number of subscribers that, of users that are connected to that exchange. And of course, there we have a problem, a public policy problem, because we need to define how we are going to address the issue of re removing the scarcity. And this is a, a public uh, policy issue. So I would like more or less to say to say this. So the, the basic principle of net neutrality is ensuring that civil rights of people are uh, not menaced and that competition between operators, between ISPs, telcos, and over the top operators, uh, the competition is fair and uh, the, the level, the, the field is, uh, the playing field is level. We cannot say that this is, uh, um, a general thing, so we don't have a rule for all kind uh, of networks, the same rule for all kind of, uh, of physical networks. There are wireless networks and fixed networks, and that the situation is different. Wireless, is wireless access is shared, fixed access is dedicated. Not all the backhauling uh, from, the from the exchange to the core uh, is the same. Sometimes it's in copper or, in, or uh, wireless, and there we have uh, a capacity problem and a tragedy of the commons problem. Sometimes it is in fiber, and in fiber we don't have a tragedy of the common problem. So uh, the, the general policy issue should be, should be to, in my opinion, to remove scarcity on the backhauling and not to uh, and not to uh, manage the traffic. Uh, so there are different situations. There is no one size fits all rule. Uh, we cannot say. Uh, the, tra the management of traffic uh, is necessarily uh, uh, the, the policy of, ma of, tra of managing the traffic is not necessarily uh, bad. Sometimes it is needed when you have a, a scarcity that is not removable. Then you have a public policy issue. How can I go and remove that, that scarcity? Either by, either by changing the, the market rules or by uh, having public funding uh, or by having some kind of other intervention. So. Uh, it is uh, uh, un percorso, it's not a fixed situation, it's an evolving situation. Uh, the basic issues is maintaining a, a, a level playing field for competition and ensuring the user rights. Okay, thank you, Stefano. Um, now, Alessandra Zorre will try to build something more on, on this concept and uh, uh, try to explore the problem of uh, this interconnection between uh, operators and uh, neutrality of uh, services. Uh, so I will also start from uh, a couple of uh, uh, definitions of neutrality, which in my mind also uh, put uh, in, in a broader scope uh, uh, the, the concept, uh, looking not only in uh, the communication infrastructure, but uh, the whole, uh, let me say, internet, eco uh, internet ecosystem. So one is uh, the ability of uh, end user and users in general to access and distribute information or run application and services of their choice. So anybody can uh, be able to put information on the web, to look for information, to develop services, to run services uh, uh, without say dependencies uh, or without anybody that can uh, uh, make at risk in uh, different ways uh, the way this uh, this uh, uh, freedom is uh, is given to the users so I would like just to highlight three I would say trends uh, in the internet uh, that uh, are on one side are definitely positive trends on the other side 
may make uh, some challenges to the concept, the general concept of, of neutrality. One trend is about uh, the massive information that uh, is available on the web. I mean, this is a trend which is uh, increasing uh, year by year since the last 10 years. Open data, which is uh, also under discussion today, uh, is definitely positive, but on the other side will increase again the kind of the, the uh, information, uh, structured data, uh, rich content, uh, which uh, will be available. And uh, on, on, and in this, uh, in this sense, uh, the, the, the way to access the information, so the neutrality on the, on the way that everybody can look for the right information uh, and, uh, and, uh, and select that is a, is a, uh, is a, is a challenge. So the search neutrality uh, clearly is a, is a neutrality which is coming out uh, as an important aspect uh, of uh, of the overall concept. So uh, the recent uh, experiments in comparing the results uh, uh, of uh, of the search of different uh, internet companies, uh, which uh, uh, I liked the fact that the results are you know more focusing. Uh, on, the, on different ecosystems of uh, application or content where these internet companies are developing uh, cle clearly, I mean, uh, um, show that uh, uh, there is the need also to, to focus uh, the regulation and uh, all the attention also in terms of research on, uh, on this aspect. Another aspect is about uh, uh, the, uh, the ability of uh, better and easily interact uh, with application and services, uh, which uh, now is, is, I mean, currently solved by the apps. So in, especially in the, mob, in the mobile market, uh, uh, the standard uh, HTML uh, or the standard uh, web, as, as we knew since just a couple of years ago, now is, uh, uh, is definitely uh, moving into the apps model and the app store model. So also in this respect, uh, clearly this uh, opened up uh, uh, you know, the market because it uh, broadened the market to users, which typically in the past, uh, they, they could not uh, access the, the, that kind of information uh, because of course it was too complex even for them. So, uh, so this is very positive in this way and it makes also easy to, to, to use the information. On the other side, uh, it creates uh, this, this kind of mold uh, that uh, instead of having you know the possibility for everybody to to open a shop on the internet, uh, if you want to really have success on the market on that market, you need uh, to knock on the door of the of the internet players, the big internet players uh, over the top, and then to ask them to to publish your application on their on their uh, uh, app store. So, and this is uh, I mean. Clearly, uh, it's open to everybody, but there is still a choice. I mean, uh, there is a choice that they made, uh, they make in order to, to let you uh, go on that market, uh, and uh, there is, a, I mean, the sharing of the revenues, etc. So, this is also a very, a very important aspect uh, because the, the, the market is going there, is going there very fast, and uh, and uh, this is changing again the way the, uh, the, the people or the companies do business uh, on the net. The third one uh, is about, uh, I would say, the personalization of the data. Uh, clearly, I mean, uh, the, the available, the, the massive available data, but also the trend of simplifying the, the life of the users uh, requires uh, that uh, either through, through social network or not, uh, you, I mean, the, you, you build a kind of avatar uh, that uh, understands what you need, uh, uh, what you like, uh, uh, where you are, uh, what is your calendar, your agenda, and uh, your friends, etc., uh, etc. Et and this is very good, of course, because uh, I mean, we cannot uh, live in the digital life uh, without uh, the, the capability of accessing uh, rapidly and easily information we need, uh, or getting new friends uh, that may, uh, where they, they have similar interests. But on the other side. Uh, uh, again, a challenge uh, is uh, the way this is done. This is done uh, without creating a bubble, without creating uh, a, a filter between us uh, and uh, and uh, the, the open internet again. So, uh, 
this I would say another trend which is coming out very very fast it would be very important in the future and uh, we need uh, to also focus on this kind of neutrality because this is impacting uh, directly the, the general concept of neutrality so the last aspect I would like I liked is that uh, all uh, the the different kind of neutralities, the, the more traditional uh, net neutrality, which is uh, focused on the telco, vertical market, uh, uh, vertical integrated market also. And the new trends of, of neutrality of the services, uh, they have definitely in the, in the interdependencies, interdependencies in terms of the infrastructure, but also in terms of uh, the business model, because uh, each one depends on the other and the, the market is the same, they are competing and they are regulated, uh, all of them. So, um, I really hope also that uh, the, the, the tools uh, that uh, the, the experts, the researchers are developing uh, to look at uh, neutrality and to uh, raise uh, issues uh, will uh, also move in, 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 into this sector and will uh, look at the general uh, uh, market and uh, will support us to understand how the players will compete, of course, uh, but fairly and, uh, and without uh, making at risk uh, the, the general concept. Okay, thank you for sharing uh, this. And, uh, um, now, uh, I uh, for a few minutes uh, to um, just... Uh, to just uh, uh, move the discussion from um, to, to just move the discussion from uh, the let's say theoretical aspects to more practical aspects so uh, how actually one can try to quantify network neutrality and uh, in particular I will talk uh, um, a bit about network measurement and uh, uh, the new bot project which is uh, the project I'm involved in uh, I will not enter into the details of the project because, uh, as you can see there, there is a huge poster and in the poster session I will give you uh, more details of the new bot. This is just uh, a set of uh, quick highlights. So, uh, the first remark I want uh, to give you is that um, when uh, you think about uh, um, a non-neutral non -neu uh, network in the classical sense, um, not uh, talking about search neutrality, but in the just classical sense of moving around bits. Um, you, you can imagine it uh, um, j just as a, a highway with uh, uh, two lanes, uh, a fast lane for um, privileged uh, packets, uh, data, and uh, um, a slow lane for normal data and communication. And of course, uh, um, there is a um, much uh, more ordinary unprivileged data than um, privileged data. And uh, the problem is, uh, like uh, it happens with, say, cars uh, in real highways, that if there is too much um, traffic, uh, in the end you have uh, uh, worst quality. I mean, uh, you can uh, arrive late because there are many other cars, uh, and, or you may lost uh, yourself, and um, etc. And the same holds for the world of data. So there are these two uh, roads, and the, mes the message here is that uh, if there is discrimination, there is a difference in quality, and uh, um, this is actually maybe good for us uh, researchers because we already know um, quite well how to assess quality and we can use that as a, a foundation to try to um, assess whether there is neutrality. Let me briefly explain uh, how, how, how it works to, to measure quality. Basically, you see there is uh, your house with your PC connected to the internet and a server. And uh, um, you just need to be careful that the server must be uh, quite close to, to your house. And this is for a number of technical uh, reasons. Um, and uh, if you uh, are careful uh, with respect to that, uh, you, you can um, do as follows. You can either send data from your house to the server or, or the other way around from the server to your house. And this is the, the orange uh, line 
and uh, um, while uh, there is this transfer in progress, you you measure, uh, say, the speed or the latency or things that are interesting to you. This uh, is uh, an assessment of quality. Uh, so, how to build an assessment on neutrality on top of that? Well, not so difficult, at least in theory. Uh, wh what you should do is to do this uh, uh, quality assessment for, say, uh, one protocol, then choose another protocol and do the, the same quality uh, assessment. And then you have uh, um, the assessment of protocol A and the assessment of protocol B. You repeat that many times, so you start having many trials and you do that for many users. Um, if you go down this path, what you end up with is a big database, or quite big database, uh, which um, tells you the, the story of uh, a, two different uh, applications or protocols in uh, a portion of the internet. At this point, having that data, you can uh, analyze it and uh, try to understand whether there is uh, um, a, a, an unexpected difference in performance or not. If there is, uh, it, uh, it's clear, it, may, um, it clearly is uh, a violation. If not, uh, no, no, no violation. So, based on that, uh, um, I will very quickly <coughs> know what works. Um, it's a program that you install, that you see in the center, in your laptop. The program stays asleep for most of the time, but uh, sometimes, periodically, uh, it wakes up and uh, contacts a master server on the left, saying, ah, what should I do? And uh, the server uh, answers, you should do this test, in this case the test is named BitTorrent, with this server. In this case the server is named Johnny. Um, this is uh, probably the most powerful concept, uh, in, uh, one of the most powerful concepts in Neobot design, because it allows to change either the server to contact or uh, the, the kind of test depending on uh, um, circumstances, evolution of uh, discrimination and um, stuff like that. So, um, that said, uh, once the Neobot knows what to do and with whom, it uh, proceeds, so you see the, the part on, on the right, uh, and uh, uh, Newbot contacts uh, Johnny and says that he wants to do a, a test, uh, and uh, the server is okay with that. So, uh, as I explained before, there is this exchange, uh, and uh, um, uh, during this uh, exchange, a bit torrent test, a measurement, and uh, um, in the end, they, uh, they, they both share what they have seen. Newbot sends Johnny the, the, his results, and um, also, Johnny sends uh, new what, uh, what uh, he has seen, and uh, this uh, basically gives complete information. Um, the one uh, key problem is that uh, um, we must uh, uh, and we want to store on Johnny the results uh, because uh, we want uh, to do two things with results, to publish them and to study them. But uh, the, the, the the issue is that uh, results contain the, in, the internet address, uh, which uh, um, is personal data in the uh, framework of European laws. Uh, and so the, uh, the next uh, speech after mine will uh, talk uh, a bit more on, on this issue and how we arranged the new privacy policy to allow for collecting and publishing uh, the, the, the address of the new bot in this uh, diagram. So. For me, it's over, and um, you, I remind you that post the session. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Simone. As you can uh, read in um, privacy policy posted on uh, Neobot uh, web the website, um, Neobot doesn't uh, monitor or analyze your internet traffic. It uses um, a tiny fraction of your connection capacity to perform a background transmission test, sending and or receiving random data. The result contain uh, such um, information that uh, are um, important for the project, uh, such as download speed, latency, and the other thing Simone said. Uh, also, the results contain uh, your internet uh, address. So, 
concerning uh, data protection on Neoboot, the question were two. The first one, if IP address is a personal data, and the second one is, if it is, which kind of consent we have to ask and obtain from the user in order to proceed this data. As you everything probably knows, uh, an internet protocol address is a numerical label assigned to each device uh, that participate in a computer network uh, and that use the internet protocol for communication. So the IP address is a number and it identify a machine and not a person. But it's like a telephone number or a license plate, and so we have to uh, have uh, regard to the uh, privacy directive, European privacy directive, in order to uh, know if we have to consider it a personal data or not. Uh, Article 2 of uh, the directive says that personal data is an information relating on, uh, to an identified or identifiable natural personal and an identifiable person is one who can be identified directly or indirectly but uh, more important is uh, the recital 26 of the same directive uh, that uh, specifies that uh, to determine whether a person is identifiable we have to have account uh, to all the means likely reasonably to be used either by the controller or by other, any other person and uh, this information, this means uh, can lead us to identify the said person. Uh, this kind of means are more uh, um, treat by uh, the Article 29 uh, Data Protection work, uh, Working Party that uh, has uh, published a lot of opinion on uh, this matter. Uh, the last one, the Opinion 4 of uh, 2007, is very important because uh, it said that uh, the criterion of all the means likely reasonably to be used either by the controller or by an, uh, any other person uh, should take into account all the factors at the state. Uh, so we have uh, to have regard to the cost of conducting identifi identification, uh, but also uh, the way the proceeding is uh, structured, the advantage expected by the controller. And so we have to consider the state of the art in technology at the time of the processing and the possibility to, of, for development during the period for which the, for which the data will be proceed. So we can say that uh, um, in uh, Europe uh, we have to consider IP address as a personal data and I know that uh, there is a big debate on uh, this matter uh, between uh, Europe and the uh, United States in particular uh, having regard to uh, some big uh, company like uh, Google that uh, doesn't agree with uh, this interpretation but we have uh, uh, to say that uh, thank you to this interpretation uh, we have uh, won some um, big battles uh, uh, like a peppermint case and so uh, um, this interpretation allow to protect the internet user from uh, any attack on the matter of copyright but we can say even more and that this interpretation allow to protect the user from uh, inspection not only deep packet inspection but because the uh, IP address is not only on the payload data but also on the header and so um, this interpretation will be uh, ensure also net neutrality. So the second step was uh, to uh, choose what kind of consent we had to uh, ask to the user, the Neobot user and um, uh, of course uh, we have uh, uh, no choice in Europe uh, we have the opt-in solution and so um, just um, uh, uh, 
particular. At the very beginning, we thought uh, that uh, we could uh, uh, solve the problem under a special provision of Italian privacy code that allows researchers to collect data without consent of the data subject for historical, statistical, or scientific purpose. And so Neobot could be a scientific purpose. But uh, we left uh, uh, this uh, idea because uh, uh, in this case, Neobot could not publish the result of the research if not uh, completely anonymized. So we choose this kind of solution. This is the privacy dashboard posted on the website. Uh, we ask the user to uh, flag on the information, um, privacy information, and then he can choose between collect or share. If the uh, user uh, flag the consent to collect, um, the um, project will collect his IP address in order to process the result, and uh, uh, Neobut will publish uh, the result um, just like aggregate data. If uh, the user um, flag the consent to share, uh, this is uh, the best uh, for us. The IP address uh, um, is uh, uh, shared with other researcher, uh, quindi not only the researcher um, authorized by the project and uh, the result uh, can be published. And um, this is uh, the, the, the last uh, phrase on uh, uh, the um, on the website this will be with this will uh, empower the internet community eventually leading to a better understanding on the net so we hope that everybody flag on the consent to share the data thank you okay thank you monica uh, let me add that um, this uh, is going to change a little bit because uh, uh, and this is uh, a new stuff. Uh, we are integrating Newbot with MLab, which is uh, represented here by Tiziana, and um, as probably Tiziana will uh, stress, uh, MLab has a much more, uh, I, I'd say, radical privacy policy, which is uh, uh, you want to use the platform, yes, you must give all the permissions. And so uh, given that uh, we are going to use their servers, we must uh, configure Newbot uh, to um, uh, ask the users all the permissions and uh, if uh, uh, the, the user does not give both uh, collect and uh, and the share we, we cannot uh, basically run tests because uh, we are not allowed to do so Tiziana so uh, good morning everybody I'm Tiziana from Google and I'm the tech lead of a project called MLab which stands for measurement lab <clears throat> next slide please okay uh, the idea, the main goals of MLab is to provide internet users, researchers, and regulators with open data about problem performance. And MLab is a collaborative effort of a number of entities coming from the research community, from the policy world, and from the industry. And you can see a number of them here in this slide. The main concept, the bottom line of MLab is really to be completely open about everything. So, if, and ultimately to have to be open about the data. And the, we believe that this is really the key to have a, go, a good science, ultimately good data uh, about broadband performance. So first of all, in order to provide open data, we first provide an open, broadly deploy server platform that researchers can use to deploy in, uh, in, internal measurement tools. We currently have 57 servers in 19 locations worldwide, and we are currently doubling our server footprint in Europe because we're going to support the European Commission starting 2012 to measure broadband performance in Europe. And next slide, please. Researchers can use this platform to deploy uh, into a uh, broadband measurement tools. These tools have to be open source and they have to be available to any internet user to test different characteristics of their internet connections. And here, I mean, we have one of the examples, actually Newbot, who has been de de deployed on MLab a few weeks ago. We currently, we're currently running 12 tools on the platform. 
users can access those tools in different ways. Some of the tools are web-based, so you can access them through a web browser. Other tools can be accessed through a mobile um, app. And other tools are hardware-based. And you, you can see an example of each such a category at the bottom of the slide. We currently have, we currently serve about two, uh, 200,000 tests every day. And really, the key point here is that since the tools are open source, all the internet community can uh, that can review the methodologies uh, used to measure again different characteristics of the network. Next slide, please. So we have the platform. We have a number of tools. Whenever each tool runs, uh, a user gets some information um, about its own connection, and at the same time, we collect all the data that is that is produced during the test, and we make all the data publicly available. And we're talking about raw data, IP addresses included, since, I mean, given the previous talk, and we provide all the data in non-aggregated format, non-anonymized format, publicly available to everybody. We currently have more than 440 terabytes of data that is available, completely available to researchers, to regulators, and to the public at large. One of the, of the key aspects of this data set is that it has been collected consistently across time and geographies. So by using this data, it's possible to compare broadband performance in different countries worldwide. Uh, in the last two years, we already have incredible examples of use of this data, both from the research community and from regulators. From the research community, for example, you can see at the bottom left of the slide, a study conducted by, the, by Dave Clark from MIT, who analyzed uh, the, diff the aspect, well, um, how a specific configuration um, of the client, of, of a, a user, can affect performance on the network. I won't be too technical on this. On the, la on the bottom right of the slide, you can see two examples of regulators that use MLAB, both by uh, creating new tools, uh, to run, uh, to measure, uh, what to do broadband measurement, and by using the data. For example, we had the EETT in Greece. They use the data, they um, incorporate one of the MLAB tests in their website. They uh, they basically advertise uh, these tests across different, uh, in many different ways to Greek consumers. Consumers can run this test and all the data is visualized in a, a map on the website. And at the same time, we're making all the data publicly available. Finally, on the top, uh, on the bottom right of the slide, you can see the FCC report, a report that the FCC has published a few months ago that um, did a study about broadband measurement in the US in 2011. And this is really, it was a really incredible achievement because it was the first report completely based on open data. And I mean, since they were using MLAB. So I won't go more into details about this. You can find all the information on the website. Thank, thanks for your attention. Okay. Thank you very much, Tiziana. And uh, now Jeremy Zimmerman will uh, talk about uh, Respect My Net. Among other things. Yeah. Mm. Um, thank you very much for, for the invitation. It's a, it's a pleasure to be, to be here. Um, I'm Jeremy Zimmerman, I'm the co-founder of the citizen organization La Quadrature du Net. We are um, a citizen toolbox for everyone to understand um, legal and political process that endanger uh, fundamental freedoms on the internet and a toolbox to enable everyone to be able to participate in democratic debate and try to, to change things. So we've been quite active on this debate of net neutrality on the EU level. And um, what I'm seeing here is that w we mostly all agree on, on a definition of net neutrality on an economical point of view. It was the, the, the first uh, intervention about uh, competition, among other things. Uh, we also mostly agree on the definition of net neutrality on a, on a technical perspective. There are very uh, important questions that are still open and that need further researching. To name a few, um, precisely list what kind of network management policies are acceptable and what policies are not acceptable. Um, how to define a managed service that it is okay to prioritize 
against the regular internet and what is a, a, a fake managed service that won't be okay to, to prioritize uh, how to uh, address the, the difference between fixed and wireless network is also a question in debate um, but also what about the prioritization deals that some internet service providers will strike with some uh, service providers that is outside of the standard net neutrality question uh, regarding the user access. Um, also, what about the overall bandwidth market related to those prioritized deals? When we hear, oh, there is a bandwidth uh, shortage, therefore it justifies that we restrict uh, users' connection. What about the, the, the reality of the bandwidth market? So all these questions are technical and still open but they can be research. Uh, brilliant minds like the ones here can cope with such questions. Um, also, we, 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 we can agree quite easily on what would be a, a legal definition of net neutrality. It's maybe the, the less easy, but uh, we can do it. There was a law proposal in France uh, that was rejected, but that was quite precise about it. There is now a, a law uh, currently being adopted in the Netherlands and um, in France, we've had this uh, parliamentary report from the uh, Commission of Economic Affairs of the, the Assemblée Nationale. Um, it is a multi-party report and it is very precise on how to legally address the question of net neutrality. The, the, the question I want to, to ask now is once we have all those definitions, what shall we do? What do we do next? And then we come to the political aspect of net neutrality. So you, you know that because you're the Nexa Center for Internet and Society, so it's not just about the technical issues, but about how uh, the, the society as a whole will deal with it. So we've been in the political debate for the, the past years now and try to, to impose um, our vision of net neutrality through the, the, the revision of the telecoms package. Unfortunately, we were uh, not as strong as the American operator AT&T, who was the, the strongest lobbyist against net neutrality uh, on the EU level, which is a bit shocking by itself. Um, then uh, there was quite a political debate in the telecoms package, so the European Parliament, by concluding this unsatisfactory telecoms package, asked the Commission, what shall we do about net neutrality? And Nelly Cruz, the EU Commissioner in charge of the, the digital agenda, began working on the question. And it was very frustrating to us. Um, I told you about the French report from the Commission of Economic Affairs. It was done in a, a period of six months and was a 90-page, very documented report. I encourage you to, to read it and, and translate it. It contains very, very important parts. And two weeks after this report was issued in France, Nelly Cruz issued a report after one year and a half working on it. And it was a 12-page document saying, well, net neutrality, yeah, it's important, but mm, we're not even sure there is a problem. And so that was the, 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 the conclusion of Nelly Cruz after almost two years after the telecoms package. So it literally infuri infuriated us to see that political game of pretending there wasn't a problem and using that as a pretext to do nothing. Because we, we imagine that the pressure on Nelly Cruz from the operator side must be tremendous. So by not doing anything, she is playing the game of the operators who are already deploying the technologies that allow for the, the restriction of access. And once they're deployed, it will be extremely difficult to, to make them roll back. So this is what led us to this idea of uh, Respect My Net. I think I will describe it maybe in more details in a, in a later uh, slot. Uh, but the idea is to make that problem visible. So Nelly Cruz cannot say anymore, ah, there's no problem, maybe. To make the problem visible and to help everyone who wants to, to, to contribute to have uh, um, a, a place to do it. So it, it is um, a citizen uh, reporting platform for infringement on net neutrality. Basically, it requires, I think, quite a high level of technical skills. And uh, I think it is mostly network uh, technicians, network experts who contributed so far. The plan is to open it to 
uh, reports generated by tools such as Noibot or uh, MLab and to, to be able to automate this process. But so far, people come to respect my net and say, okay, I'm in France, my operator is named uh, Orange, I have got this kind of contract. And I noticed that when I try to open, let's say, an SSH connection through the port 22, it is blocked. So people describe their problems, then other people come and comment and say, no, it's wrong, I got the same contract, but it works for me. Or at the contrary, other people come and confirm and say, me too. I have the same problem. And then we generate a, a kind of human report about the problems on net neutrality that uh, already contains, I think, 70 reports that were confirmed of problems in the EU with net neutrality. So we hope to bring that on nice paper form, long meters of paper that we will someday put on the, on the desk of uh, Mrs. Cruz. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. And uh, as I already said uh, to you, I think uh, this website may become uh, a gold mine for researchers that want to investigate uh, on uh, network neutrality topics, really. And uh, so now mm, we are open uh, to questions from the audience. And uh, Simone, can can I just add one point? Yes. Uh, uh, I used to have, sorry, I have to take away the, the year pieces again. Um, well, I, st I started working on the internet a long time ago, as you know, but uh, in, in the very early 90s, uh, you had uh, different uh, levels of service that were neutral. Uh, what I mean is that you often hear that uh, the violation of net neutrality is fundamental in order to have uh, enough money to make the investment needed. And I agree that there might be uh, tiered services, meaning that you pay different for a different kind of services. Uh, but that was already in place back in the 90s. If uh, many of you recall, you had modem access at 28 kilobits, you had the ISDN, which was more expensive, and it was 64 or 128 kilobits. I mean, in Europe, and you had few ones in the US and so on. and. Uh, and you had different levels of overbooking, meaning that you accept some ISPs that guarantee the one to five ratio of uh, overbooking on the backhauling, or one to 30 or one to 40. And then you had different level of service, but it was neutral. It was not going to look into the packets or discriminate between the different protocols, as you mentioned. So you still can have uh, different prices for different usage, uses of people without going into the details of the packets and without violating net neutrality. So uh, when I say that we, we miss uh, a common framework of terminology, a common, a common definition, etc., and I think that this could be one of the works by the Nexa Center and by Nexa Center to think about it, to have a taxonomy of all the things related to it, and so to, to, to have a, a common set of definition and uh, and uh, yes, of course, technical is just one portion of the game. But when you don't start, if you don't start from the technical point of view and you don't agree on a set of, of terms and conditions and, and, and framework on the technical term, then it's going up on the Maslow pyramid, it becomes more difficult. This is my opinion. Thank you, Stefano. Also, I would like to add that uh, there is a link, uh, a deep link with the structure of the market. Uh, because uh, the market you were mentioning was uh, very different. Uh, uh, there was the telecom provider and uh, there was the bitstream provider, as you know. So I think this uh, as a... Yeah, I, I don't want to go into too much details, but of course, uh, we have a regulatory aspect uh, on telecoms and uh, luckily the bitstream in Europe uh, is ensured everywhere. And this is a major point, uh, having both ULL and bitstream is the major guarantee in favor of net neutrality and we should try to stress that bitstream should be uh, enforced on fiber access as well but i don't want to go into too much detail because it then it becomes too technical okay uh well so any questions from the audience uh yeah my it's a comment slash question for the speaker so i'm most a lawyer so my technical understanding might be flown to some aspects so i'm also asking that 
uh, in the analogy that you made with uh, like highways, uh, we have highways, we have speedways, and we can drive at different speed, right? So what Stefan was saying is that depending on the infrastructure, we can have different speed, but the speed that depends on the infrastructure. It doesn't depend on the fact that somebody tells us, oh, your car is uh, too red or your car is, uh, uh, is not worth enough as to drive at 130 miles an hour. And I believe that the, as far as I understand it, one of the most important aspects of network neutrality is exactly that. There are technical requirements uh, which is, can be given by the infrastructure. So the network is not that fast or it's a mobile access, so the, the, the access is shared, it's not dedicated. Or some packets are time sensitive, in which case we can understand that some privilege can be given to the transmission of some packages. While on the other side, we cannot accept that because of uh, a decision that is discriminatory, mostly based on economical reason, but that has an, a, 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 an effect on our ability to access services, like to be able to connect to SSH port, because somebody else decides that without a, a justifiable uh, a technical reason. And uh, my question is, this is my comment, and the question is, are we accounting of this type of differences in our analysis and measurement of, uh, of speed? And if yes, uh, how? Um, can I say one thing that is, is a comment to this question? Uh, uh, you, you mentioned the, you, you mentioned the fact uh, of uh, the prioritization for time-sensitive packets. The role, sorry, the role of a good ISP is to fill the access loop on dedicated networks, dedicated access networks, is to fill the, the access loop of the user. So if you buy 20 megs, you get 20 megs. If you buy 20 megs and you get six, so if, it, the, if the ISP does not fill your local loop, it's not doing a good job. So the, 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 good, the, the job of the good ISP is ensuring the local loop of the user is saturated. If the local loop of the user is saturated, there is going to be some congestion. Okay, the role of the good ISP in order to be able to saturate the local loop of the user needs to have enough back holding at the back and not be saturated at the back. Because if he's saturated from the back holding on, it means that he's not going to saturate your local loop. So a good ISP is the one that saturates the local loop because you buy 20 megs and you get 20 megs. Then you're going to have congestion on the local loops, not on the back holding. If you have congestion on the local loop, your time sensitive uh, packets are going uh, to suffer on the access loop. So it's you as the customer, as the user, who should have the right to request the prioritization of the term of certain kind of traffic on your access loop. The, the general policy, in my view, should be that there, is, there should be no need of prioritization on, 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 on the backbone, on the back holding, on the core, because removing scarcity is cheaper than, uh, than, than managing it on the back holding and on, 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 on the core network. On the access loop, if the, if the ISP is going to do it, is doing a good job, you're going to be saturated. And therefore, it's, I, I, I think that it's your right to request that as a service, as an additional service on top of that or best effort to have your prioritization of your, uh, of your, of your specific, uh, uh real time sensitive packets. But it should not be imposed to you because if it is imposed to you, then, uh, well, I mean, we fall into the, the, the all these problems that we are discussing now. I mostly agree with what has just been said, but um, I'd like to answer maybe in, in less technical terms. Um, I, I think it's a very good question. And we see there uh, first the limit of the analogy with the road networks and a very interesting point about the investment model on internet infrastructure. Imagine that the, the, um, the highway we take as an example could be expanded with one more way by snapping fingers. And so when there is too much traffic, when there is congestion, you can snap your finger and add one, one lane. And when it's full, you snap your finger and you add one extra lane. Indeed, you cannot do that with highway because you have to, to break things. Uh, but you can do this with bandwidth on the back hole, especially when technology allows for an increase of bandwidth, even on the, the mobile network. 
just by upgrading the routers and the hardware every every now and then. So the investment model in the infrastructure that we call the in internet has so far been organically grown by the needs and by the usage. When instead of that model you say, well, now we will choose that only the red cars can go to that speed and only the Maserati can go on that lane and so on. You break that investment model. So this is also one good, re one good reason to impose net neutrality by law as, as a perspective on industrial policy. Um, on the time-sensitive application, this is an argument we've very, very uh, much heard from the lobbyists of the telcos. Um, it was quite efficient, actually, to say, oh, but imagine, um, how did they uh, call them, um, uh, low latency applications such as uh, e-health, telemedicine application. So you speak about telemedicine to a uh, 60 years old member of the European Parliament, you know, it will resonate in his mind. Imagine, you know, a heart <laughs> transplant, a liver, a cholesterol and things. So, oh my God, yeah, I don't want that. If my son downloads too much BitTorrent or too much porn, my uh, heart tra transplant may fail someday or something. So it is an efficient uh, argument, but, but if an application requires extremely low latency to function over the internet, then it's not an internet application. By definition, when you do internet connectivity, your packets can go any other route through dozens of networks configured in dozens of different ways. So if you need the low latency, it won't work and it won't go through the internet. So either you compensate that through intelligence on the edge, like the, the buffering thing of the YouTube video that starts loading before you read it, or you need a dedicated network and you change it into a managed service and then it's not the internet. I want to just to drop a small comment on what you said. I totally disagree with respect to the low latency. I mean, SSH is low latency. It is. Try using SSH with a larger and growing buffer and you will see that. It it's won't work. So you can I mean, do it. You there are many it. interactive applications. Also, if you look at the roots of the internet, I disagree. Well, you can having fiber to the central offices, uh, you can easily increase uh, uh, and uh, and decide uh, what kind of performance you can uh, give to the to each customer very easily. This is not currently true. I mean, uh, we need uh, still some year to to to, to arrive to that uh, that point. So still, I believe there is still an issue of, uh, of the on infrastructure, on the backhauling. Uh, I'm not saying that uh, the, the, the solution is, uh, I mean, uh, this filtering uh, is uh, really blocking or whatever, but uh, we need to consider that it, there is an, an issue in terms of infrastructure, there is an issue in terms of uh, the competition between the different kind of players, uh, and uh, the regulation uh, impacts uh, definitely this competition. So I understand uh, uh, the, the, I mean, why, let me say, the, the political uh, makers are, are, I mean, are carefully considering this uh, this issue, uh, especially here in Europe. So I mean, uh, nothing to say, but uh, I'm not uh, against what you said, definitely. But uh, on the other side, uh, I really, uh, uh, I believe that we we have to consider also again the, all the the value chain and the business models. Uh, and to look uh, uh, not only to the tech operator uh, issue, but also on the issue of, of the other kind of players. That's, that's it. Yes, it is indeed a, a step forward, uh, meaning that just we are starting to talk about backhauling, and this is fine because normally you don't talk about backhauling and when you talk about net neutrality and the issue, the central issue of backhauling. Uh, just to give you an idea, in Italy we have about 13,000 exchanges. Of, the, of those 13,000, uh, 10,000 are backhauled in fiber, nearly, and uh, 3,000 are backhauled not in fiber, meaning copper of, of wireless. And these 10,000 serve about 90% of the population. So just having a, a, a rule on, on those 10,000, just it would make a safe position for 90% of the, roughly 90% of the population. Uh, Simone, I don't know, can I add a comment or yes, is there yes. somebody else? Please go. 
Okay. I just, I mean, I don't want to go into details about net neutrality. I clearly, I mean, it's clearly complex to understand which protocols should be uh, treated differently if there is such a case. But I think I, at least I really wish it was possible to to require ISPs to be open. I mean, I know that like this comes back to what I was trying. I mean, I, I presented to you about MLab, and we, 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 you might agree on the fact that uh, neutrality yeah, that ISPs have to do have to do some have to use some specific traffic management techniques uh, for low latency traffic or not. But the bottom line, in my opinion, is that it's, at least they should be completely open about the, the, their network uh, management techniques. They should be open, and then once they're open, the internet community can judge can be, you know, if their management techniques make sense, or if it's about uh, the, giving priority to the red car versus the blue car. So again, I would say, not not going into details about which protocols should be uh, privileged to, against the other if that should happen, but at least ISPs should be open about what they're doing. Uh, yes, it's not always as easy, because I know, it depends, I know, I know. It depends on competition. Right. You know, if you don't have competitive alternatives, then... No, no, absolutely. I, I'm that's, not saying... that's why I, I say that ULL and Bitstream are both essential in all places, because then it like, guarantees that if somebody makes some kind of management, there is somebody else who might not do it. Yeah. Because if you have just one infrastructure, otherwise you won't have any choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I <laughs> guess you. we should. Thank uh, you. Very clear. Up. Thanks. <laughs> but uh, Stefan, I agree. I completely agree with you. I, it's not an easy problem. I just say I wish we could at least start there. Okay. Uh, thank you all uh, the speakers uh, for this panel. Um, I think it was uh, interesting. And uh, uh, since I'm the moderator, I just want to drop uh, the final comment. Uh, which is uh, as a European citizen, as a researcher, I would like to, um, let's say, be able to do research, and I know there are many lawyers here, uh, possibly a bit easier, uh, because, um, I mean, it was uh, quite hard for us to implement a proper privacy policy, and maybe uh, I could have used at that time uh, studying protocols or doing uh, uh, testing, so um, I think this issue should be considered. Uh, a researcher is not uh, a big company and maybe uh, should have uh, different uh, provisions. That's it. That's my opinion. Okay, thank you.